Coming up on today's episode of the podcast, I am talking to Dr. Juliet Young about ways that we can be more creative in the work that we do with our clients and service users. We're also talking about how she got into psychology and what her experiences were like of doing her training during the pandemic. She also offers us her top tips for reducing burnout as an aspiring psychologist. Hope you find this episode so useful. Welcome along to the Aspiring Psychologist podcast. I am Dr. Marianne Trent and I'm a qualified clinical psychologist. I love being able to introduce you to the backstories of people you may already have heard of or you may already follow on social media. And today's guest might well be one of those people because she does wonderful illustrations all about mental health and working as a psychologist. We are talking to Dr. Juliet Young, also known as Creative Clinical Psychologist. You will get to learn the backstory of how she ended up in psychology and also one of the other professional psychology disciplines that she considered before becoming a clinical psychologist. Let's dive in and hear all about it and I'll catch you on the other side. Hi, I just want to welcome along Dr. Juliet Young to the podcast, who is a qualified clinical psychologist and also a really creative clinical psychologist too. Hi, Juliet. Hi, yeah. So we first crossed paths um, because somebody had said they'd love to see us talk to one another. Um, and that was over on Twitter, forward slash X, whatever it is these days. Um, before we get into you and your fantastically creative illustration ways, can we have a little bit of a think about you and psychology? Yeah, yeah, sure. So how did you... What would you like to know? <laughs> Everything. When did you first take an interest in psychology and how did that unfold for you? When I was back in secondary school, actually, I wasn't very well behaved in secondary school and I would often be sent to the head teacher's office or the deputy head's office. And I had been watching... Um, Tanya Byron's Little Angels. I don't know whether people will remember that or whether aspiring psychologists are old enough to remember that, but it was a TV show that... Um, a psychologist went in and, and helped parents to think about their children's behaviour um, through a kind of needs-based lens. Um, so I was I was really fascinated by that and interested. And then in school, when I would be sent to the uh, teacher's office, I would kind of bring in this. Well, they need to be doing this better. They need to be thinking about this. And and um, my one the, the deputy head teacher at the time said to me, Juliet, you should be an educational psychologist. And of course, I didn't know what that meant, um, but that sort of stuck with me. So I guess that's that's kind of where it began. I love that. They didn't just see you as being precocious and put you back in their box. They thought, she's kind of good at this. We should probably help her cultivate this. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So then, then presumably you went off to university to study psychology. Yes. So I did a I did a BTEC at college. I, I didn't do the normal route of, of A levels. And within that was a kind of a module on psychology. And that's where I, I fell in love with it. And then after a year out, um, decided that actually I, I did want to go to university and then, yeah, applied and, and got on. Studied at UWE to do my undergraduate. Great. Um, and did you then fall in love with clinical psychology during your undergrad degree or did that come later? No. So I had no idea what clinical psychology was probably until, I don't know, six or seven years ago, actually. Um, so that would have been, yeah, I, I started that 16 years ago. So there's a big chunk where I didn't know what clinical psychology was. Um, and it wasn't until I, I knew what educational psychology was because my teacher had mentioned it. And I, I got a job after my undergrads working in, in like an eating disorder, a home for people with eating disorders, really. Um, and um, decided through that that I really did want to pursue a career in educational psychology. So I went and got a job in a school um, and then worked in uh, worked there for six months, worked in a, went and got a job in another school, worked there for five years. And within that time, applied for educational psychology and I didn't get on. Um, and actually in, within that process. So, yes, yeah, so it was around about the same time as I read um, a book called 
um, by again by Dr. Tanya Byron, um, uh, a skeleton cupboard. Or what that book does is it gives I think it's four case studies and talks about um, these people and their difficulties and and really it sort of formulates. Um, and that really captured me and really made me think, actually, maybe I, I really like this idea of formulate, formulation and thinking about um, people's needs. Um, and yeah, so I then decided that I needed to get a job within the NHS and get some um, experience in mental health services. Um, so I got a job working on uh, crisis teams, they're known as in, in Bristol and intensive teams. They're also called in the broader trust that I work in and um, just doing bank shifts. Um, so, yeah, so adult mental health services um, and then also decided I wanted to do a master's um, to just try and get my head into clinical psychology. So I ended up, and this, there's probably a long, there's a bit of a long story behind this, but I ended up going to the University of East London um, to study clinical and community psychology. Um, now, when I applied for this, I kind of went on it because I was really captured by community psychology and what the, the course outline was um, without really realising that how far east east the university of east london is from bristol um and i would get up at yeah four or five in the morning get on a coach get to central london <laughs> go for a day of lectures and then do the same return journey so i would do i did that for yeah for a year um well not quite a year i think it was sort of eight months once a week um and then alongside that um, and while doing the crisis work, also got a job as my first job as an assistant psychologist. Lovely. Gosh, yeah, that is quite the commute, isn't it? <laughs> and then you only need yeah. one decent train strike or delay and it just sends your whole day into chaos. Yeah, I think there was a, a time when I think it was the beast from the east. I don't know whether you remember that when there was that, that huge um, few days of snow and um, I yeah I ended up getting on a coach and going to London for all the lectures to be cancelled and then being stuck in London having to stay at a friend's house. Oh gosh but I think what so you're was, really yeah, nicely it, portraying is that actually as an aspiring psychologist we can really spread ourselves very thinly um, you know expecting ourselves to be in several places at the same time and you know trying to learn whilst also probably being quite stressed and pressured um, and holding many different yeah thoughts in our head and responsibilities you know it's not easy stuff is it no and I, I think I think you've got to want it and I think you've got to um, I, I guess it's about there's there's a a lot of hard work that goes into building that um, portfolio is it I guess of, of experiences and um, but I, I also think there's there's something about values and for me like going and doing the masters in uh, UEL like that was I was so inspired by the lectures especially the ones around community psychology and we um, had a, a term of doing critical psychology as well that I it didn't feel exhausting or hard it fe I felt very energized by it I felt very inspired and I felt very um I guess it really confirmed to me that I wanted to work in clinical psychology um because I could do those things that I kind of saw as educational psychology like working with a wider system thinking in a kind of more systemic way but also um yeah but also meeting those needs and kind of wanting to be able to do therapy. And, and I guess it's working across those systems like Bromf and Brenner's um, ecological system theory. I'm going off on a tangent, That's but yes, right. it's, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard, I think. Um, and yeah, I, I was I think I was very fortunate to have had quite a lot of experience behind me at the point I decided I wanted to go into that. So that kind of acted as a bit of a platform to get my job as an assistant psychologist and to, you know, get onto the master's course and to be able to be working in a kind of a flexible job doing crisis work to enable me to fund my master's and and to be able to fund, you know, my rent and stuff like that as well. So it's, yeah, it's, it's tough. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, um, one of the themes in the Clinical Psychologist Collective book was this, 
perseverance um, and that you really need it because otherwise at any point you could be like, oh, I'm just going to not bother. I'm going to go and do something else. Whereas, you know, the more and more you persevere, the more and more likely you are to actually get to where you need to be to get on the doctorate, to get qualified. It's it's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it is a lot. And I remember as I was listening to you speak, it was reminding me of when I was doing my master's and I was working full time whilst studying a master's part time, whilst I'd also had a car accident, I had back problems. I'd just broken up with a partner as well. There was like, there could not have been any more going on in my life. And yet it was that year that I did my successful form to get on to the doctorate. You know, it's like someone mm. might have said to me at any point, oh, why don't you just not apply this year? Like, there was would never have been a question that I wasn't going to apply that year. You know, any time I wasn't at osteo or physio or <laughs> or crying about my, <laughs> I, I, was, I was working on my form. Like there was there was never a chance I wasn't going to do it. And actually I did get on that year and it, it the back's fine now. The back was fine by the time I started training, but oh, it's <laughs> that that continual motion isn't it you have to you have to want it mm -hmm. you know and I guess the support systems around you have to be good enough that you don't burn out yeah and I I think that I think you have to want it and I think it's also okay to take a break from it I I didn't I was very driven but I I had also had sort of taken a break from it and I'd had that you know, I'd had several years where I just enjoyed working and enjoyed my job working in a school. And I wasn't really think I was, you know, I had it in my head what that I wanted to be an education psychologist. But I also really focused on just enjoying my job and growing myself within that. So I guess it's it's about maintaining that drive. But also there's not a time pressure. I think a lot of a lot of aspiring psychologists I've spoken to feel like there's this real urgency to get on and I completely understand it because if you want something you you want it to be you know happening and 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 if there's a risk it might not happen you really you know you want is that uncertainty and sitting with that uncertainty but what I always say is that actually that that time before training was was probably some of the best part of my career so far in that I you know, I had a lot more freedom before, you know, there's when, once you're qualified, there's a lot more responsibilities and a lot more, th you know, things that you have to do that actually when you're an assistant or when I was working in, in the job in the school that, yeah, you have this sort of freedom. And, and yeah, I would always say to people like training is just one part of your journey and like you've got your entire, you know, working life and to really think about that actually it's OK just to enjoy what you're doing. And obviously there's financial implications like it's really difficult to be. Yeah. And, I, and that's that's it's probably even more so at the moment with the cost of living crisis, but it's really difficult to be on a very low paid job. And I was for, you know, when I worked in the school and assistant psychologists don't get paid um, amazingly and, and like, and it, yeah, I think, I think, so I'm saying that, but I also, I guess, recognizing that there is a financial pressure on people to be able to qualify. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's, that's really difficult, isn't it? And, and other people will have, um, yeah, more difficult financial situations and other factors which put pressure on that, like having children and yeah. Absolutely. And thank you for that um, really nice, compassionate reframe, because you're right, there is no, sometimes people say to me, oh, you know, I really need to be qualified by the time I'm 30. And it's like, well, why? You know, you can still, you know, live your life whilst you're training if you, if you want to, you know, you can have a family whilst you're on the course if you want to. Um, you, you can, you can, flex it to look how you want it to look and when I graduated from my undergrad I went around the world traveling for six months and had I not had those experiences and the experiences of saving up to go traveling and then the experiences of having an absolute ball with my friends as an assistant psychologist I love it when the Facebook yeah. memories come up of that time you know that all helped with my resilience and with my you know, not burning out and with just having fun along the way so that it wasn't just about psychology. You absolutely need more in the background, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You have to, you know, your life comes first. Psychology doesn't come first. And 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 yes, we do, you know, we live in a, in a society which means that our communities don't tend to hold us. So we do have to get a job and we do have to be able to fund our lifestyle most of the time or, or most people tend to need that. And, and um but your life, you know, you've got to prioritise that because, yeah, it's really important, isn't it? It's, it's who you are. It's what gives you your nourishment. And, yeah, I think that that is, 
yeah or, or one part of what gives you your nourishment um yeah I totally agree so what year did you start training as a clinical psychologist then so I started 2019 so started four years ago I've been qualified a year amazing and how has that journey been for you transitioning from trainee to qualified um I think it's been yeah I think it's been generally a good one um I think that training was very challenging because we trained the pandemic hit six months in, into training and and there were lots of challenges that came with that in terms of placements I mean it gave us more time to be at home because we didn't have to travel to lectures because lectures are online but I wonder the impact of of that on how much you know information I retained from lectures just sat staring at a screen and and yeah uh, my placements were tricky because a lot of them were remote I don't work very well remotely I like being somewhere I like being among people that's kind of how I work best um, so I would say that I probably haven't got a comparative experience other than the people who trained at you know the similar time or through the pandemic um, but I really enjoyed qualifying and being able to um, just be in the office more and to go into a job that I loved and and not that I didn't enjoy some of my placements but there were some you know there were some real highlights in some of my placements but ultimately where I'm working now is the area that I want to be in and therefore it's very values based and it meets that need to you know to be working with my values and with my interests and I think so yeah so I think an easy transition I would say I was definitely ready to qualify I was definitely ready to you know to get out into the world um and you know that's not to say that I wasn't training wasn't really important there's lots of gaps that I probably still need to fill and, and learning is an ongoing journey isn't it so I don't mean it in the way that oh yeah you know I just knew everything and I needed to leave but in that I was ready to go and start the next stage mm. yeah yeah and I guess as I hear you talk I guess I'm wondering if there's a niche in the market for for doing some research into whether the the pandemic cohorts have actually had a more autonomous experience that it's felt I don't know somehow less protected or that you're kind of having to just do more self-directed stuff and having to really force yourself to to concentrate and focus as as we know happens when we're trying to zoom learn you know there's always other things going on whereas if in like you said if you're in the room if you've got your cohort there you kind of you have to show up you have to be concentrating as much as you can yeah and I think that yeah, it'd be really interesting for someone to look into that. And I, I also think that there's room for one thing that I think clinical psychology doesn't have is kind of a, like a yearly refresher or like a two yearly refresher where where you have to go back and do some of those things and, and think about those, those um, skills and gaps or I don't know. And I guess that might not work if you're in a very specialist um, area, but having having the opportunity to be able to refresh, I think, would perhaps mop up some of those gaps, which, yeah, I think during the pandemic was it was just really hard to learn and to stay engaged. And, and you're not having that contact with others other than on the WhatsApp group. And, you know, I was lucky enough to have a very good friend who lives on the roads next to me. But other than that, there's not that contact time. Um, and I think that's that's a really vital part of training, actually, is is learning from your peers. And I feel like I missed out on a lot of that. It really is. But I think also the training is as much about instilling your confidence in yourself as it is teaching you the stuff. So I remember I was actually unwell for the half a day on the training for how to work with people with a bipolar presentation. Half a day. For that, that ended up being kind of quite a key part of my qualified life is working with people within that disorder. And I, I still sometimes wonder, like, would I be better at this if I'd had that half a day training? And of course, we know the answer yeah. is no, because <laughs> what can you possibly hope to learn about a whole kind of way of working with people and understanding and conceptualizing difficulties in half a day? You, you just can't, you know. I think that I think that's really true, and and actually you know, what's the saying, um, jack of all trades, master of none, um, that you come out of training with these tiny pockets of things. So yeah, it, it probably actually is that there is, I, I wouldn't 
I wouldn't have retained all of that stuff, whether I was doing it online or not. But I definitely think, yeah, I, I identified with that as well. I missed um, the ACT training for our CAMS, so CAMS um, or acceptance and commitment therapy for CAMS um, and then also for the adult. Um, and I missed both of them. I had I was ill for one, I had a funeral for the other. And it, I like I just didn't have time to catch up on the lecture notes. I think I probably had a look at them, but it's, it's not the same as being in a lecture. And all the time now, because ACT is something that I think I'm re I, I really identify with, with values and thinking, you know, in the, the work I'm doing around um, with young people with their asylum claim, there's, you know, as we're going along, there's not much we can do about the process, which is a very long process. So it's helping them think about, um, you know, accepting the situation they're in and what can they do within that to, I guess, find pockets of, of happiness through meeting their values or whatever. So I have a kind of loose idea of what ACT is, but I don't feel like I fully understand it. And I feel like that's a big gap that I need to, I, yeah, I, I need to go and revise and I'd miss during training. I'd say there's always time and, you know, even in even now I'm experiencing and you know enjoying learning about new topics and new areas I love an audiobook um, and so that's a really nice way for me to learn things um, you know you are fairly newly qualified and you can just give yourself time to to bed into being qualified and just yeah turn to more you know learning and enhancing your learning needs as and when the time is ready, I would say. So you've told us really nicely a little bit about some of the qualified work you do there. I think you do you work a split post, am I right in saying? Yeah, yeah. So in a in teams that are sort of attached to each other, but yeah, two different distinct roles, both clinical psychology roles. Brilliant. Can we say a bit more? Are you happy to say a little bit more? You don't have to identify the service you work in or anything, but are you happy to say a little bit more? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I work, so two days a week, I work in um, a service for children in foster care. Um, and that is mainly working with the systems around young people, although I have got a, a few young people that I see weekly for therapy sessions. Um, and that's where I worked as an assistant psychologist as well. So it was sort of like coming home. Um, and I really love that work. I, I really like the complexity. I like working with systems. I like thinking about attachment and trauma. I'm really interested in in kind of developmental trauma and the impact of that and how I guess how that can be some of that can be repaired um so that's the two days a week and then two and a half days a week um I work a nine day fortnight um two and a half days a week is in the asylum seeker and refugee clinic um and that is working with children seeking asylum families as well um and um, it's primarily a trauma service, so we, we've got quite a narrow commissioning in that it is, it is just, you know, working around post-traumatic stress and, um, yeah, but that is prevalent in, in that population because most people who have had to leave their country of origin have experienced, you know, horrific trauma, um, either when they were there or on their journey. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of our, our children um meet our, a lot of our referrals meet our criteria anyway i once did um a very specialist piece of work linked to a gp who specialized in supporting um asylum seekers and refugees and it was just oh i just i learned so much about being human and humble and really i guess really like you said boiling down those core values of what's important to me what's important to them and how we can kind of try and help people find some sort of stability in a world that feels like it's just swirling and ever changing really tricky stuff yeah i think that's that's a really it's really yeah it's i think that's really kind of hit that hit the nail on the head in the in the kind of the swirling I've got an image in my mind of this yeah the kind of swirling stuff around them and i as an example, I did an assessment last week and I drew out Bronfenbrenner's um, ecological systems theory and kind of talked about as a way of validating, like, I know all of this stuff is, you know, going on in, on your, in your country of origin and the impact of seeing that on social media. I know that your asylum claim is, is really 
causing you lots of stress. I know that things within the system around you is uh, really stressful. And unfortunately, we, we, you know, I might be able to write a letter to the solicitor to give them a nudge to, you know, give you some more information. I might be able to do some drawings to try and make a shift in the wider system, um, even if it's a very minute shift. But ultimately, the, we're, we're restricted to working, you know, with you and, and with with just within the individual and, and and I think that's yeah I think it's really hard for people to to get and understandably so because actually if your mental health and well-being is being impacted or, or if the main the main difficulty um, for you are these other things going on in your life and somebody is sitting down in a room with you to do therapy and you're like well that's that's not what I need I need that other stuff to change and and so it's I think it's yeah it's an interesting job to be in because actually a lot of the time you're working within systems which are making people more unhappy more stressed they're exacerbating some of their symptoms like it's it's a real challenge to do that um and sometimes i really question when people are like this isn't this isn't going to be why would doing some you know breathing exercises and and um you know muscle relaxation that's not going to change the fact that i've got an asylum claim hanging over me which might send me back to a country where i'm killed and and it's sort of you know it you it's it's very it's very you've got to be very careful, I think, to make sure that you're validating alongside um, what you're offering. Yeah, validation was absolutely the word that I was thinking of, but also just expend, ex- extending some compassion and sometimes just being seen for where you're at right now and having a space to kind of explore how that feels can be wonderfully transformative. Yeah, I think relationships and if I sort of look through the lenses, the attachment lenses that um, in my other role and, and apply them within the role with um, asylum seeking children is is thinking about actually safe relationships. And, you know, I think it's the trauma recovery model that actually the bottom of it is safe relationships, therapeutic relationships. And I think that, yeah, if I can offer that space, even if we don't do the trauma work that we're we're kind of there to do, it, it's giving somebody an experience of somebody who is safe and containing and listening. And in a world that's very hostile, you know, yeah, just the, the context, which is very hostile if you're a young asylum seeker, especially if you're unaccompanied arriving in the UK then that is, you know, that's somebody who's giving something that is the opposite to hostile. And and I guess somewhere along the line will we'll give you a sense of safety in the world, even if it's a very small one. Absolutely. And I, I find myself kind of drawing comparisons between foster, um, foster care systems. So when I work with people in the asylum seeking um, role, people contacted me kind of years later to say you know thanks and actually that made a real difference and just being able to hear your voice at times that felt really challenging and being able to draw upon some of the stuff we'd done actually really did make a difference and it's knowing that you can kind of you can still check back in you know if if they want to so we don't kind of lead that ourselves but um I don't know maybe years down the line people will come back to you and say gosh, that was really incredibly powerful. And I think that's a really nice thing that you get to be part of someone else's story, even though you may never know that you're still being held in mind. It's a real magical thing we do, I think. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a real privilege, I think, isn't it? Um, to be in that position. Um, and yeah, to be able to have that sort of impact on people's lives and to be with them and and a lot of the trauma work I do, I, like it's such an honour for people to share their story with me. Like it, it, it really is like an amazing honour to hear and witness, you know, their story and some of the really awful things that they've never shared with anyone since they've arrived in the UK, other than maybe on their, you know, in a very formal way in their uh, in their application. But in you know, thinking about the emotional impact, thinking about. Yeah, but I guess being alongside them in an emotional way in, in sharing that is, is a, like a deep privilege. Like it, it really is like, yeah, I'm very lucky to have mm. that really. 
Yeah, and that the ability to be able to kind of help them de-shame that process as well is, is you know, amazing. So important. So tell us a little bit then about your wonderful illustrations and how you started to weave that into your clinical work with people. Well, I guess, I mean, I... I've always drawn and illustrated, you know, my whole life really. So it's and it, and so it's sort of a natural, um, a natural thing to bring it into my work. And when you know, when I worked in the school, I would be doing sessions with young people, and I would be drawing to try and help, you know, think about ideas and and to, it often takes the focus off that kind of um, dyad, doesn't it? It, it? it it takes a different focal point and enables conversation. And so. I think I probably bring it into my clinical or have been bringing it into my clinical work for a long time. I guess that when it kind of ended up getting like publicly coming into um, view, is that what you mean? Like, how did it kind of evolve or do you mean? Yeah. Um, so I guess, I mean, I got, I just bought a tablet in the pandemic about, I think it's about three years ago um, and thought I would share some drawings on various concepts and, and yeah, just gave it a go and, and yeah, it just became really popular. And it still sort of surprises me now that everyone likes my drawings so much. And, and I think I put one yesterday that was about um, compassionate leadership and it's, you know, sort of a thousand people have liked it and there's lots of shares and lots of comments in it. And, and I think that it, yeah, the feedback I've had is that people find it really useful to use in their clinical work to to kind of distill ideas down into a visual concept and, and that that can be really useful, you know, because there's lots of really complex concepts in psychology, aren't there? And and we live in an increasingly visual world. So, yeah, so that's that's kind of what I hope to do. That's sort of what's ended up happening. And it's ended up, you know, I, I do various other, there's been various offshoots from it now, which I, I really enjoy. So I, I did yeah. see the one you mentioned. I think it was like, it was almost like a waterfall. Like, was that like a yeah, rainbowy yeah. waterfall? It was really, really nice, really nice. And I'm just in awe of you because um, I just, I'm just not very good at art. I have these wonderful ideas in my head and then, that doesn't come out of my pen like it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't translate but you do yours on a tablet do you so is that how that like are you like an apple pen kind of girl how does it work practically I don't I don't have a I don't have an iPad. I've got a Samsung. People, I always get messages saying, "What do you, what do you do these on?" And people often think that it's on an app actually, and there's like a clip art image, and I'm just bringing them together. But it's it's all hand drawn. So, I yeah. So I just I've got a an app called Ibis, which is I don't think it's like a well known one at all, but it's just what I started using, and and now I'm most familiar with. And yeah, I'll just draw them and, and it can take, sometimes they can be very quick. Sometimes it can take me hours and hours and hours. And I really enjoy, you know, I really enjoy doing it. It's very therapeutic for me to sit down and draw and just have the creativity or the, the time to be able to be creative, actually, the freedom to be able to kind of create. And I, I think in pictures. So I often, you know, I think in like I see concepts and I kind of am visualizing all the time things. So it's it's just kind of, yeah putting that that then gets translate translated into yeah drawing it and sometimes they're not that good either people sort of say oh uh, like I quite like your scruffy little drawings like I just think that sometimes that there's like a wonky arm and it like kind of it doesn't all come together but and there's some that I've done which I sort of look at and just think that's awful um but yeah there's there's yeah that's just sort of how how it comes together really I I like that I think um life is imperfect isn't it and sometimes it doesn't need to be pristine and polished and I'm sure it's still even your scruffy ones that you don't like are still far above what what I could achieve how did you start to think about putting putting your ideas down into a book how did that come about so I was contacted actually by a editor um, for, from Jessica Kingsley Publishers and she just contacted me saying, I really like your drawings. I like how you sort of distill concepts down and your explanations as well. Like, would you be interested in, in doing a book in like maybe kind of an, a, a, I think she suggested maybe a 
clinical psychology one or CBT or sort of an area. And I, I like, you know, I was honoured when she emailed me that because I just thought that's, you know, what a privilege for somebody to be thinking about, um, you know, offering you that opportunity. And yeah, and then that that formed into, I actually contacted two of my lecturers because I thought if I'm going to do a an illustrated guide to clinical psychology, lecturers who teach on courses about clinical psychology are, are the best place to go. And I I contacted one who's who's very, um, not very actually, that's probably unfair, but she's a CBT, is, is, she's a qualified CBT therapist and I guess kind of gives that more CBT lens. And then I also contacted um, my research supervisor at the time who I guess took more of a critical lens um, towards clinical psychology and some of those more community psychology values and then yeah and then we all got together and then yeah created the the proposal and then that got accepted and then yeah April April this year I was it was like a second thesis um fin- trying to finish it off and trying to finish off the illustrations and stuff Amazing. So we're recording this at the tail end of 2023. Um, but we're very much planning that this episode's going to come out when your book is available. So tell us what it's called. Tell us where you're imagining it might be available for purchase. Tell us all of those good things. So it's called An Illustrated Guide to Clinical Psychology. And yeah, it's by my myself, Juliet Young, and then Dr. Catherine Butler, Dr. Rachel Pascal, um, and it's going to be available on Amazon. I think it's already available for sort of pre-sale and yeah, major bookshops. Um, we're also doing a book launch, um, which I think may be on, I think it's the 27th, 28th um, in Bath. So if you're um, in Bath, but there'll be information about that on my Instagram page and on my Twitter page. Um, closer to the time around that brilliant how exciting your very own book launch what an exciting book baby to be launching on the world yeah so your ideal client for that is an aspiring psychologist is that the is that that's the ICA yeah yeah so uh aspiring psychologists um we also talked about it just being useful for newly qualified um psychologists and also those who might be working alongside clinical psychologists and wanting to understand what what it is as a profession you know to have in a staff room where there's a multidisciplinary team um and just i guess it it could be a reference book for you know i i might find it useful to reference for another section that someone else has written on on i don't know cognitive analytic therapy and just to remind myself what the key principles it's very much a, an intro and, and summary so there's you know a page or two per idea per therapy modality per approach there's there's stuff around um yeah the first chapters on kind of the history and and some context and there's stuff around key skills so it's yeah it's a pick up flick and you know put down or you know or you might want to read it back to front but it's yeah it's sort of for anybody that it might be useful to really it sounds brilliant have you designed your cover as well i'm imagining it's brilliantly illustrated yes so yeah the cover is the cover was i gave the illustrations and it's been put together by a graphic designer actually because that's yeah that's not one of my strengths or at least something i've not tried before is the kind of the composing things in a graphic design way so and have you have you seen it yet have you held it in your hands as yet not a um not a physical copy we had the final proof um just pdf sent through the other day um which is yeah sort of bizarre to see you know that it's isb numbers or the you know and and we've had some um endorsers who have read it and given some comments on it and it's yeah it feels yeah it's just really exciting like I didn't I I remember sitting down with um, one of the other trainees a year into training and sort of talking about wanting to take it a bit easy on training and say oh it's not like we're going to write a book or anything and then here I am you know four years later with my book coming out in a few months it just yeah I love that and um, if people want to learn more about you or follow you on socials where should they head Juliet? So Instagram's probably a um the the best place so i'm creative.clinical.psychologist um i've recently set up an instagram for sort of my like dr juliet young 
Brilliant. Thank you. I'll make sure there's details in the show notes for how people can follow you. There will also be details in the show notes of how you can buy Juliet's book as well, which is available now as we are looking at future March 2024. So thank you so much for your time. Wishing you the absolute best of luck with your first book, Baby. Um, I hope it flies really well for you and really makes a difference and helps people understand what it is that we do and perhaps feel a bit more contained and understood by those around us as well. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. And you've given us lots of lovely advice to reduce burnout along the way in clinical psychology as well. So thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you for sharing your time with us too. Well, thank you for having me on. I've really enjoyed talking to you today, Marianne. Oh, thank you. Likewise. How how incredible. Please do go and follow Juliet over on Instagram, Creative Clinical Psychologist. And her book is available now. So check out the details in the show notes. Or if you look on my socials, you'll be able to see links to the book as well. Hope you found that interesting. I love the way that psychology allows us to blend our skills, our interests and our passions into our clinical work. I'd love to know what you think to this episode. Come and let me know over in the free Facebook group, the Aspiring Psychologist Community with Dr. Marianne Trent. Please do also subscribe and like um, if you're watching on YouTube. And why not consider checking out the Aspiring Psychologist membership, as well as my own books, the Aspiring Psychologist Collective and the Clinical Psychologist Collective book. Thank you so much for being part of my world and I will look forward to catching up with you for the next episode of the podcast which will be available from 6am on Monday. Take care.